Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending where you're at. Welcome to the uh, third NIST virtual webinar on the topic of p-values. We're very fortunate to have three superb presenters today with direct experience on the importance of p-values in making decisions. NIST is turning 30 years old this year and provides academia government agencies and industry with cross-sector events. This event is open to all. We hope this will show how p-values provide an important framework for making decisions where the consequences of an error is very important. This third webinar will focus on the use of p-values in making decisions. In 2017, the ASA published the ASA Statement on P-Values, Context, Process, and Purpose. Purpose. Since that time, many statisticians have been thinking and writing about alternatives to the traditional p-value. This culminated in the publication of the special issue of the American Statistician, Statistical Inference in the 21st Century, a world without p less than 0.05. On May 23, 2019, NIST hosted a webinar discussing the major ideas covered in some of these papers. Recordings and slides for the May webinar are available on the NIST website, along with subsequent events, including today's event. <clears throat> Following the very successful May webinar, NIST took these conversations on p-values a step further by inviting Jim Berger, Sander Green Greenland, and Robert Matthews, who published in the special American Statistician issued to share their insights about their specific ideas during a webinar in November 2019. That is also available on our website. This third webinar will feature individuals from fields where p-values are heavily used in decision making and multiplicity adjustments in the frequentest sense is a core consideration for drawing inference. The speakers are Yoav Benjamini, Alicia Lar Karakwiri, and James Hung. And I will introduce each of them uh, before their presentations. The program today will have uh, will begin with Yoav Benjamini. And Yoav is the Nathan and Lily Silver Professor of Applied Statistics in the Department of Statistics and Operations Research at Tel Aviv University. While I'm speaking, Yoav, you can start, uh, you can open your slide set. He's a member of the Segal School of Neurosciences and the Edmund Safra Bioinformatics Center, both at Tel Aviv University. He was a visiting professor at Wharton, UC Berkeley, Stanford, and Columbia Universities in the past. Professor Benjamini is co-developer of the widely used and cited false discovery rate concept and uh, concept and methodology. His research topics are selective and simultaneous inference, replicability and reproducibility in science, and data mining with applications in biostatistics, bioinformatics, animal behavior, brain imaging, and health informatics. He received the Israel Prize for Research in Statistics and Economics, is a member of the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities, and has been elected to receive the Carl Pearson Prize of, AS, of ISI this summer. Yoav, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For me, it's the first experience of uh, uh, carrying on a lecture in, uh, on the wave, airwaves rather than in person. I hope I can manage to do well. So, um, the predictability and replicability crisis uh, is uh, well familiar, but uh, I will just mention shortly as an introduction that even though it started in science uh, well in the last century or in the previous century, in the 90s, of uh, 1990s and so on, it caught the attention of the public with Ioannidis, why most published research findings are false. Uh, with this kind of uh, a headline, there was no wonder that uh, the general uh, public uh, got interested and uh, uh, 
the two twists off uh, titles and trouble at the lab and, and so on and so forth. And uh, this kind of uh, pressure from uh, the general public, not from the scientific community, has created at uh, the end, uh, and not at, at the, quite at the beginning, uh, uh, attention of uh, nature and science. And um, since some problems, specific problems surfaced in the psychological literature, experimental psychology literatures, uh, there came the reproducibility project in psychological science where 100 results of papers in leading journals uh, were attempted for replication. Here you see on the x-axis the original uh, results, on the y-axis the replicated uh, results by independent researchers. And uh, this is the line of equal effect size. You can see that they are lower. Uh, only the green ones were replicated in uh, the sense that I will talk about in a minute. Uh, the red ones were not. And the red ones were the majority, 64%. 64 of the 100 did not replicate. Um, this effort took from uh, 2011 to 2015. Uh, and the replication was assessed in the, in, in the way that actually uh, Fisher originally introduced uh, the test of significance because Fisher introduced the, he's not introduced, but he popularized the p-value. And uh, then there was a problem, uh, you know, uh, a p-value is a random result. And uh, how can you say that uh, result in a second experiment replicated the result of the first experiment. The two p-values will never be the same. So that's why uh, Fisher introduced this idea that we may say that the phenomena is experimentally demonstrable when we know how to conduct an experiment, which will rarely fail to give us a statistically significant results. In the sense that the p-value will be less than some threshold in the first experiment, in the original one, and will be less than that in the replicated one. This idea goes back and in this thing with all of the controversy around the p-value to the p-value that significant, significant test, significant testing was actually introduced to be able to quantify the idea of a replicated results. Uh, before continuing, I'm going to make an important distinction which is made again and again, but worth stating to reproduce studies to start from the original data to analysis to say, get the same figures and conclusions. Replicability is the property of the results. We replicate the entire study from enlisting subjects, collecting data, analyzing the results in a similar but not necessarily identical way uh, and get essentially the same results. Uh, the names are changing. There is reproducibility and so on, sometimes the other way around. And then evidence for that is the sentence for producibility is the ability to replicate the results, which appeared in the paper whose title was Reproducibility is not replicability. So the point is that the terminology is not that important, but the important idea is that we can assure the reproducibility of a single study, but we cannot assure its replicability. We can only enhance the replicability of a single standalone study. And this is also shared by the National Academy report on reproducibility and replicability. So what I will talk about is first the misguided attack to, on the p-value, which was uh, uh, in order to address replicability problems. Then I'll talk about the selective inferences, the silent killer of replicability, and the status of addressing evident selective inference in uh, various uh, branches of science. A misguided attack uh, started, I think, with the psychological science that have published a tutorial by Cumming, a leader in the new statistics movement. Uh, there were 22 or so uh, principles. Number nine is do not trust any p-value. Number 10 is whenever possible, avoid using statistical significance of p-value. Simply omit any mention of null hypothesis testing. Number 14, routinely report 95% confidence interval. And then the editorial by Tommy Flo and Marx, uh, actually in the, regarding the basic and applied social psychology journal that banned the use of p-values. Well, this, uh, this raised the issue, is it the p-values fault? And unfortunately, ASA boards 
came with a statement about the p-values. And uh, this is the original Lazar Weinstein American statistician in 2016. It opens with the p-value can be useful, but then comes a list of do not and not and is not and should not and leads to distortion. All warnings phrased about the p-value, not about any other statistics. And at the end, it concludes with in view of the relevant misuses and misconception concerning the p-values, some statisticians prefer to supplement or even replace p-values with other approaches. So it is the p-value fault in the opinion of the writer of this. Unfortunately, I was part of this committee, but uh, couldn't carry my voice loud enough to influence the decision at the end. So uh, it wasn't, it's not a surprise that the response was that is, we should get rid of the p-value tyranny. What other methods uh, were discussed? Uh, confidence interval and so on and so forth. Um, a, the New England Journal of, uh, uh, I, I will return to that, but before that I want to say that uh, other, con other methods were confidence interval, prediction intervals and so on and so forth, estimation, Bayesian method. Uh, it is important to understand that confidence interval have the same uh, problem. Let's look at this uh, paper, uh, association between influenza infection and vaccination during pregnancy and risk autism spectrum disorder. Okay, you have here the relationship between pregnancy and the three trimesters, one, two, three. Don't try to read the numbers, you don't have to. Uh, then there is uh, any time during pregnancy and there is uh, the vaccination and those that were sick. Altogether, you have inferences about, depending on how you count, from eight to 16 different inferences. Everything is reported, there's no problem. Everything, no selective reporting in that sense. But the abstract, if you look at the abstract, abstract emphasizes exactly, trying to emphasize exactly this single one, where you have the confidence interval from 1.04 to 139. They're on the confidence interval, no p-value, no problem with the p-value. And the abstract said that the adjusted hazard radio for this one was 1.04 to 139. Okay, and that's the way it was sent to the journal. And the referees noticed, well, you have here so many inferences, don't you have to adjust for selection that you have selected this one to the abstract? Well, if Bonferroni corrected for the multiplicity of hypothesis tested, they chose eight. Maternal influenza vaccination, the second or the third semester, was not associated with increased AT risk. So the point is that you had to go to the p-value in order to protect these findings that was based only on confidence interval from doing that. So uh, what, is, what is the problem here? The problem is here is that of selective inference. And it affects p-values, it affects uh, confidence interval, it affects almost any other uh, statistical uh, measures. It's influence on the selected subset of parameters that turned out to be of interest after viewing the data. Okay, uh, and this hurts replicability, hurts uh, tremendously. Uh, there are two out of study selection, those that are not evident in the published work. This is the file draw problem, publication bias, the gathering of 40 bucks, p hacking, cherry picking, whatever name you want to use that, data dredging, hacking, and so on and so forth. Okay, this has received a lot of attention and a lot of discussion, including the original line in this uh, work. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about selective inference, which is evident in the published work. That is like the example I gave. You have every, all the information there, but then you pick or you highlight in the abstract some result, or you put some results in the table, only those that pass some threshold, significant, or the, not covered by the confidence interval. Uh, you put it in a figure, you select by highlighting those passing a threshold, like be less than 0.05 or uh, less than five times 10 to the minus eight, or twofold even, or selection by modeling. Okay, the point is that in complex research problems, this kind of in study selection is unavoidable. If you study half a million SNPs, you don't give all the results in the abstract of the paper or even in the table. You have to select. 
Similarly, this is the case in smaller, medium-sized results. Selection is unavoidable. How can selection be addressed? Well, some, some uh, I give here the four main directions, strategies, and not methods. You can ask for being simultaneous of all possible selection. This is the family-wise error rate. The Bonferroni procedure assures that if you do Bonferroni correction to confidence interval of p-value, and then you pick any one from them, it has the right coverage. Conservatively, but has the right coverage. You can ask for simultaneous over the selected, which is a new uh, criteria, where say you pick only the k-largest one, and you want them to have simultaneous over this k, so you can pick any one of them. Or you can have conditional over the selected. That is, take an example, if only p-values less than 0.5 are selected, then you can condition on this fact. And you can condition it on model selection. There's a lot of uh, current research going on in um, using all kinds of uh, model selection, like uh, lasso and so on, and then giving conditional confidence interval on the result and conditional p-value on the results. Or you can use the on the average over the selected, which is the false discovery rate for testing and the false coverage rate for confidence interval when you want to hold the property to hold uh, on the average, but not on the average overall, which any method does, but on the average over these are selected. It are selected. What is the status of addressing evident selective inference in clinical trials? For, well, for drug registration, we'll have the third talk today that you will speak, uh, uh, James Hunk will speak about uh, it in, in, uh, for FDA approval and so on. I will talk about the first and second stage and about uh, what's going on in New England Journal of Medicine. I'll mention about Bayesian statistics and end up with nature attitudes to the problem. Okay, so what about clinical trials pre-FDA? Let's take an example. Natalizumab was exempted by Gosh et al. for the treatment of Crohn disease. They were comparing three regimes with placebo, four measures of success at five time points, altogether 51 endpoints. One of these endpoints was set as a primary endpoint with a certain two infusion, certain dose level at six weeks and so on. The other 50 were described as secondary endpoints. The results for the primary endpoints were not significant. I mean, point, 0.5, not 0.05, 0.5. 27 secondary endpoints at P less than 0.05 was considered as discovery and the study was reported as success. Is it justified? Can we pick one of these and be happy about using it in continued trial? Well, this is an example, but not an isolated example. We did an in-depth analysis of 100 papers from the England Journal of Medicine of the year 2002 to 2010, all had multiple endpoints. The number of endpoints in the paper ranged from four to 167 with a mean of 27. Okay, 80% of them, the issue of multiplicity was entirely ignored. P less than 0.05 threshold was used. Uh, and uh, even when it was used sometimes for multiple looks at the data, it was never fully addressed. All study designated the primary endpoint, but conclusions were based on other endpoints when the primary failed. And I think the above reflect most of the published medical research. And maybe this is why about 58% of the phase three trials fail. It's taken from a nature reviews. These are the endpoints that are taken to the main phase three trials. Well, how should, how could hierarchical testing of natalizumab case taken? Taking the fact that this is still at stage two, an exploratory, relatively exploratory stage. Recall that you have one primary endpoint treated as one family, and you have 50 secondary endpoints treated as a second family. Okay, then you have the p-values for each of them. And you can combine the p-values for the secondary to get the test. Is there something in this group, in this family of secondary endpoints? Using SIMES test, you get 0 0.00157. 
And here you have only single one at the primary endpoint. This is 0 0.5 to 3. Now you test using the Benjamin E. Hochberg, the BH procedure uh, for FDR control on these two. And you compare this one to 0.05, it doesn't pass. You have to compare this one to 0.02, over two. it passes. Now you can enter into this secondary more cautiously and you test them with pH. So you can test now the pH, the two family with pH. The primary, of course, doesn't pass. The secondary passes. And then you see that 12 of the secondary p values are less or equal to 0 0.05 times 12 over 50, but times half, because you have chosen only the secondary family. So the conclusion from that is that, well, it's not 27 endpoints, but there is something there. And about, we can point at 12 of them and say, well, they pass even the selective, uh, uh, the, the address, addressing of selective inference. What happens in the New England Journal? So that's old, New Gene, old in quotation, uh, New England Journal of Medicine. What happens in the New England Journal of Medicine now? Well, a recent editorial that came after the, uh, the, the statement of the American Statistical Association says that some journal, this is from last summer, some journal readers may have noticed parsimonious reporting of PBS in our research articles over the past year. The new guideline discussed many aspects of reporting studies in the journal, including a requirement to replace p-values with estimates of effect or associations and 95 confidence intervals, when neither the protocol nor the statistical analysis plan has specified methods to use to adjust for multiplicity. And they give an example from a previous study uh, the fatty X and fatty X it did not significantly reduce the rate of either the primary cardiovascular outcome or the cancer outcome. If reported as independent findings, the p-values for two secondary outcomes would have been less than 0.05 and therefore would have been reported, but according to the new guidelines, p-values are omitted. So what you see is that you see, this is the abstract of this paper, and you see that for the primary endpoint, you have both confidence interval and p-value. For the secondary endpoint, you have only the confidence interval. And it goes from 0.49 to 0.9. And it gives a very strong impression that you have here a good results. Not taking into consideration that you have here 22 endpoints from which they were selected. So this is exactly what uh, later Wood Arm did when they were citing the this paper in the Nature Reviews in Cardiology. They were discussing fish oil supplement, this oil exits, and they say that it had no effect on composite primary endpoints uh, or death from CVD, but it reduced the risk of total CG, uh, corona intervention, myocardia, bringing exactly the four confidence interval that didn't cover one. So selection was done not by the p-values, but by the confidence interval. It is as dangerous as not addressing for selection of the p-values. And unfortunately, even the open science framework, which are leaders in their efforts to offer tools for pre registration of plant research, according to them, you have to specify as following if you are comparing multiple conditional testing, multiple hypotheses, will you account for this? You don't have to. You just have to say, will you or will you not? And according to the England Journal of Medicine guidelines, you benefit from not reporting the fact that you will do anything about it. Petensky and Newberger, in, uh, in a recent uh, uh, letter to the editor of the England Journal of Medicine, uh, brought uh, evidence that all nine methods that control family-wise error rate or FDR and so on, even when they're uh, correlated and so on, they're all control uh, the, the, the family-wise error rate in the weak sense. And flexibility is not an issue. And Harrington, the, the associate editor of uh, New England Journal of uh, Medicine, say that their assumption requires that the comparison shown in the manuscript be the only ones examined for possible inclusion. Why 
That's the kind of argument I fail to understand. If not all are evident, but many are, should you ignore the multiplicity of the evident ones? It doesn't make any sense. The post hoc, a second argument was that the post hoc imposition of control of the family wise error rate will reduce the power of the test of no overall treatment effect threatening the original purpose of a study. Well, if you're concerned about power, don't use family wise error rate control, only the false discovery rate, but do not ignore the issue of selection. I want to give a, a, a quick simulation of what happens when when you fail to notice that confidence interval have the same uh, sensitivity to selection as p-values. Here you have 20 values of the parameters. None of them is at zero. And you have 20 estimates of the parameters. Create 90% confidence interval and some confidence interval cover the parameter and some are not. In fact, in this case, three do not cover their parameters. So three out of the 20 do not cover. It's 90% confidence interval, very reasonable. But now select only the four, only those that do not cover zero. There are four that do cover zero and three out of these four do not cover when selected. Okay, this is as serious a problem as with p-values. These so selected four will tend to fail, shrink back when replicated. And if you put the false coverage rate confidence interval, then instead of working with, uh, with uh, simply 90%, you work with four over 20. Instead of 10%, uh, you work with 10% times over 20, and this will have the right coverage on the average of the so selected, if there are four, three, or 10. The numbers selected appear then here. So unfortunately, selective inference by confidence interval is totally ignored. And uh, in this case, the essay statement about the people is to be blamed. Uh, still, there might be a problem with the regular confidence interval uh, because uh, they might be too wide and give an impression that they cover uh, too much. And they, this is exactly what I mentioned, the new simultaneous of its selected ones because they offer a new set of confidence interval. For instance, consider that you choose the largest k out of m or the significant ones out of m. Then the new simultaneous over the k so selected extend to zero as the Bonferroni of m. That's where the selection hits you most, but extend only as Bonferroni of k away from zero. So they are asymmetric, but protect you appropriately. And uh, if you're interested really in controlling on the average of the selected, then towards zero, use the usual FCR, that is use K over M instead of Bonferroni, and away from zero, simply use regular intervals at alpha over two. So you don't give an unfounded depression about the potential positive uh, effect uh, of your study if you're in fact, highlighting the largest out of K or the most significant ones. What is happening with Bayesian statistics? In Bayesian statistics, many ignore the issue of selection. Gehrman, Carlin, Westfall, and Rublin Bayesian, did a book based in data analysis. And some even oppose it, like Gehrman, Hill, and Vajima, who explain in a series of papers and exposition why we usually don't have to worry about multiple comparison. And the underlying theoretical justification is since we condition on all the data, any selection after the data is viewed is also reflected in the posterior distribution. Well, uh, this result is theoretically true. Are Bayesian intervals immune for selection bias? Well, we can assume I'm taking exactly Gelfman example from his website. We assume there is a prior mu i uh, around zero, uh, and then we have the observation why i are uh, normal around the parameter. Okay, the parameters are generated this way. And if we look at type 95% confidence interval or credence interval, 
and the intervals not covering their problem, there are 5% marginally over all of them. But if I'm taking the intervals not covering zero, okay, total selected, then it's 7.3, not too bad. But the intervals not covering out of those selected, then half of them do not cover the parameter. What happens in this case under Bayesian credibility intervals? This is 5% as expected. Intervals not covering zero, very few. So there is a power decline. But if you look at those not covering their parameter uh, only, then it is 3.4 and not 48. And this is the argument they are making against it. Okay, but if you do the FCR, then there is no problem because it goes down to 1%. Let us now just modify a little bit the prior from which the parameters are estimated. So with one over a thousand probability, we inflate the prior. Just one over a thousand, otherwise we keep everything the same. Now we look at Bayesian credibility intervals. Again, not covering the parameters, 5.1 didn't change by much. Intervals not cover zero, were protected as here. But if we look only at those that, um, that do not cover zero, then the Bayesian credibility intervals fail as much as the regular intervals. While, of course, the BH selected and uh, FCR adjusted fulfill the promise. The point I'm making is not against Bayesian analysis. The point I'm making against using the Bayesian argument to avoid addressing the issue of selection. Not everyone, not all Bayesian do that. Uh, connection with FDR and large inferential problems, a FDR, local FDR variants, empirical base, so on. So there are people who are using Bayesian, uh, the Bayesian approach and address, and, if, and address the issue. And in fact, the false discovery rate is very much into it. Uh, as you know, you have heard, uh, whoever participated, two, uh, two lectures on two symposiums. And from this point of view, I think that it continued to do damage in the sense that ignoring completely the issue of selection. And I will uh, conclude with uh, this example taken from Nature magazine, where uh, Armheim, Greenland, and McShane argue that you should retire statistical significance. And this is based on, one of, I think Greenland was one of, one of the speakers in the symposium. And the editorial in Nature says scientists rise up against statistical significance. Okay, what, what, do, they, uh, what do they say? They start with, let's be clear about what must stop. We should never conclude that there is no difference of no association because the p-value is larger than a threshold such as 0.05. Well, I think every statistician would agree with that. There is no, no question about it. You do not prove the null hypothesis by not rejecting it. But then they continue by objecting to statistical significance in general, and then objecting to any bright line, as you probably have heard. And they rely on the American statistician papers and Hulbert et al. in particular there. They say, Cook, in that paper, Hubert says, Cook the grace for the tough old bull. Statistically significant expires. Hubert Levin and Utz object to any bright line to ask, how can we address multiple compression without a threshold? We can't, and we should not. Well, the first statement is simply wrong, okay? We can, we can do adjusted p-values. Confidence interval, we have to know what is the confidence interval. The p-value, there's no problem. And we shouldn't try. We shouldn't try. Why? Because you can use nuanced reporting. No need for a bright line. And they give an example from Rifle et al. Rifle et al. discussed the influence of river inflows on plantation distribution around the southern perimeter of the southern sea. So going there, I became familiar with this area of science as well. Well, there is a table. There is a table with p-values. No confidence interval, p-values, okay? But the, the abstract brings only result with p less than 0.1, okay? Not less than 0.05, but at least that 0.1, okay? Out of the 41 results, only those 
that were actually were significant at the point one level were brought were highlighted in the abstract. I don't think that this is uh, this is a clear example of selection unaddressed and causing damage. Okay. Maybe the conclusion should be to ban the use of abstract. But if we don't do that, we have to address selection. Okay. I will uh, sum up for selection ignorance that ignoring selective inference, which is evident in the published work, is the current status in many branches of science and among leaders, just at New England Journal of Medicine, Open Science Framework, Nature, and even the American Statistical Association. And sweeping the p-values under the rug just worsened the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Yov. I think you've given our audience lots to think about, and uh, hopefully they'll put some I'm questions. Trying to share my screen. Yes, you can unshare. Okay, what you see here is the, my explanation of the industrialization of the scientific process that brought this replicability uh, crisis to our door. Thank you. The, uh, the next speaker is uh, Alicia Cariquiri, speaking on p-values are rarely used in forensic science and the criminal justice system. That is too bad. And, and she can, while she shares her slides, I'll give a, a brief introduction. Alicia Cariquiri is the distinguished professor of statistics at Iowa State University and was president of the International Society for Bayesian Analysis in 2001. She's been director of graduate education in statistics at Iowa State and served as associate provost from 2000 to 2004. She is currently director of the Center for Statistics and Applications in Forensic Evidence. The center was established in 20. 15 as a way to apply more objective science in forensics field when dealing with human evidence. Her work also focuses on mental health issues, which include leading an ongoing effort by the National Academy of Medicine to evaluate veterans affairs, mental health and services. Carrie Query, Alicia has worked with various government and health agencies around the world to improve health and nutrition. With that, Alicia, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Jim. Can you hear me? Yes. Can um, you hear there. my screen? Yeah. Yes. Yep. So the year was is going to be a very, very difficult act to follow, um, <laughs> but I'll try. <laughs> uh, so I waffled a little bit, and so my talk is now called um, "P-values are rarely used in forensic science," and that can be bad or can be okay. We'll see how it works. Uh, thank you, uh, Jim, for inviting me to present this webinar. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm happy to get questions uh, later. So the, at least in the United States, the criminal justice system is based in the presumption that uh, we are all innocent until proven guilty. And so this appears to be the perfect setup for hypothesis testing, right? So you set up a null hypothesis that says uh, person is uh, person is innocent. Then you uh, hold on. Uh, then you uh, evaluate some evidence presented in court, and um, the jurors, in principle, update their belief uh, in on whether the person is guilty or not. It turns out that it's not so simple. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, some of the issues that make it uh, a little bit more complicated than one would think. So here's an outline uh, for my talk. Um, I'll, there's going to be two parts. And uh, the first part is uh, uh, I'll talk about the evaluation of evidence. And this is where p-values should not be used. Um, the, I'll talk a little bit about the legal setting as a hypothesis testing problem. Uh, present a motivating example and then uh, go over some limitations and very, very briefly touch on alternatives. And then the second part has to do more with criminal justice and this is where p-values might be useful and unfortunately are not used. And this is, uh, I'll talk about the chance of using p-values as a sentinel statistics, which in a sense is what Fisher uh, 
presented this p-values for, right? So he never intended them to be used for inference. He intended them to be used for um, just as an indication that something may be going on uh, with uh, the data. So um, hypothesis testing in the legal context. It's inevitable that we might wish to draw a parallel between hypothesis testing and questions that uh, are asked in court. This is very, very tempting. Um, so again, before any evidence is introduced at trial, the defendant is presumed innocent. Uh, then we have a trial and evidence is introduced. Um, and then in principle, jurors update their presumption uh, based on uh, the weight of the evidence. Does the evidence support the hypotheses of guilt or does it support the hypotheses of not guilt? And I put them exactly opposite there. H not should be not guilt and H A should be guilt. Sorry about that. Um, and so that's the simplest, that's a simple way we, we may think about this. Um, there's of course the errors that we uh, uh, know about when we do hypothesis testing, the type one and the type two errors. Uh, the type one is rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. That's what we might call a false positive. And the type two is when we fail to reject the null hypothesis when in fact the null hypothesis is not true. And that's what we might call a false negative. And uh, in principle, um, I'll go this, I, I'll, I'll mention this a couple of times in this talk. The two hypotheses are really not treated um, symmetrically. The type one error is often considered to be more serious. And so we um, only wish to conclude HA if we have really strong evidence against H naught. Um, and so the parallel with a uh, justice system is, uh, you know, we think about type one error um, as the as deciding that a person is guilty when in reality that person is innocent, and the type two error is uh, letting the guilty person go. So decide that a person is innocent when in reality the person is guilty. And uh, it's funny; it depends on who you ask. Uh, but in general, most of us would think that a type one error in the legal context is a whole lot more serious than a type two error. Well, it turns out that that's not, I mean, that looks so nice and, you know, and, and well-defined. It turns out it's not that simple. So let me, um, let me uh, use a couple of motivating examples. So a crime is committed and there's evidence found at the crime scene. And there's any number of different types of evidence, but imagine you find a fingerprint and you find some blood. You get yourself a suspect and the suspect is charged with committing the crime. And so uh, there's many different forensic questions you could ask, but a question that is often asked is what's called the question of source. So is the suspect the source of the evidence that was found at the crime scene? So was the suspect's finger that left that print, uh, does the suspect's DNA match the DNA uh, obtained from the blood, the genetic profile obtained from the blood at the crime scene? And so what we'll do for the rest of the talk is focus on this simpler, and I say simpler in quotes, uh, question of source. Um, and this, I put the graphic in the wrong place because this is supposed to be a broken window and that's what um, I'm going to start talking about in the next slide. So let's suppose um, we have, I'm going to use, oops, sorry. I'm going to use glass fragments um, as a motivating problem because things are kind of easy to understand from a statistical point of view. So let's suppose that a window is broken in the commission of a crime. So somebody, uh, somebody robbed a house and to get into the house, they broke a window. Uh, you get a defendant and you find, you recover uh, glass fragments from the defendant's clothing. Before you conclude that must be the guy who broke the window, uh, an interesting factoid is that most of us walk around with at least 
some minute glass fragments embedded on our clothing uh, from background sources of glass. So um, you recover the fragments from the defendant's clothing. So now you uh, want to ask yourself whether the fragments on the defendant's clothing and the fragments you obtain from the broken window are indistinguishable in some sense. And so essentially, this is an inference problem. You have fragments from the known source, in this case, the broken window. You have fragments with a questioned origin. Those are the fragments from the suspect. And you want to compare uh, those. Um, you assume that those uh, fragments are random, oops, are random samples from uh, two populations. And you wish to know whether the mean of those two populations uh, is the same. So um, there is this organization called the American Society for Testing and Materials that publishes standards. And these are the standards that are used in any number of different disciplines. In particular, there's a bunch of standards that are used in forensics. And so this particular standard, 29, 27, 16, talks about um, obtaining and interpreting uh, data on the chemical composition of uh, glass. And the, you know, it doesn't matter what the method is, this is a very fancy method that allows you to detect minute concentrations of elements in uh, very tiny glass samples. And so there's no question that the measurement process is very good. The problem is the interpretation of the results. And so here's what ASTM says in section 11 in this particular standard. It says, all right, this is what a forensic scientist should do. You grab at least nine fragments from the reference source, in this case, the broken window. You compute the mean and the standard deviation. Um, and then you have, if you can, at least three fragments from the question source, and you compute the mean concentration of these elements. In glass, it turns out uh, they look at 18 elements. Uh, and so in principle, um, you have 18 tests that you're going to conduct. I am not even going to get into the issue of multiple comparisons here. Let's pretend we're only measuring one element. And so um, the standard goes on and says, all right, from the mean that you got uh, from the reference fragments and that standard deviation you computed, um, construct, a com construct an interval, which is the mean plus minus four standard deviations, four standard deviations, and then say, if the mean in the question fragment happens to fall into that uh, interval that you just constructed, then you declare those two sources to be indistinguishable. If the mean from the fragment, from the question fragment, doesn't fall into that interval, uh, then those sources are distinguishable. Now, there are so many things that are wrong with these, this procedure that it's difficult to know where to start. So this is clearly a statistical inference procedure, but it turns to, out to be really um, a very strange way of doing a hypothesis test. So um, how would we formalize uh, the procedure that the ASTM uh, recommends? So, all right, let's suppose that we have a mean mu sub C, and that is the chemical concentration of uh, an element in the reference population. So this, dang it. So this would be uh, the fragments from the broken window. Then we have uh, mu sub s, which would be the mean of the population uh, from which the suspect's fragments were sampled. And the test of hypothesis uh, in this case would be that the two means are the same versus the alternative that the two means are different. And the decision criterion that ASTM establishes is um, the following. Look at the difference between, well, um, look at, I, sh I should have hats here. Look at the difference between the two computed means, so hat, hat, um, the two sample means. And if, though, if that difference is less than or equal to four standard deviations, then uh, conclude um, you fail to reject H naught essentially. 
Now, should we even think about doing something like this? And the answer, of course, is no. Um, so, uh, and I'll come back to this, um, I'll come back to this uh, slide in a minute, but um, how would this, let's suppose that we were to do this test or hypothesis. So how will we proceed? Well, uh, we would quantify the difference between the two means using some test statistic, a t-test or something. And then uh, typically we would summarize our results using some p-value uh, that measures the strength of the statistical evidence against the null hypothesis. Now, we all remember the p-value definition. That's just the probability that we would get a statistic that is at least as extreme as the one we obtain in our sample if the null hypothesis is true. So we're conditioning on the null hypothesis being true. And so obviously, very importantly, the p-value doesn't tell us a thing about whether the null hypothesis is true or not. It assumes that the null hypothesis is true and it says nothing uh, at all, again, uh, about the alternative hypothesis. So how many things can we say are wrong with this approach in the legal context? Okay, so where to start? So the use of hypothesis testing and p-values, the way I have described them in the legal context, uh, are really fraught with issues. The first one is that the null hypothesis appears to be backwards. So the, what we're testing is the null hypothesis establishes that uh, the, the evidence at the crime scene and the evidence uh, on the suspect match in some sense. There's no, they are indistinguishable which of course then presumes, um, so in other words, the, the null hypothesis says that the defendant is presumed to be the source of the evidence um, until we prove otherwise. That's number one problem. And I'll go to, over these ones uh, one by one in a minute. The second problem is that the p-value tells us absolutely nothing about the probabilities of false positives or false negatives. Um, the third problem is that the hypotheses are not treated symmetrically, and in, in this particular situation, given that we have them backwards, this is particularly bad. Um, the, sec the fourth issue is that even if we happen to reject H0, uh, we still cannot conclude, fail to reject H0, we still cannot conclude same source, and I'll say why in a minute. And lastly, we're not even answering the question of interest, which is, is the defendant guilty or not? So um, let me go uh, over these um, quickly one by one. The first one is this question of uh, do we have the hypothesis backwards? And so, um, yep, if we follow the ASTM approach, we certainly do. So H0 here, if H0 corresponds to same source, then the presumption is that the defendant is the source of the evidence. And what does this mean? It means that the burden of proof is on the defense, which is exactly contrary to what our criminal justice system says. And furthermore, the defense here needs to provide strong evidence to contradict the null. That's number one issue. The number two issue is that the worse the data you have, the noisier the measurements, the harder it is to reject the null hypothesis. So terrible data, uh, you know, the less you know about the evidence you're working with, the noisier your measurements, the more you tend to blame the defendant. Um, in the ASDM method, for example, the acceptance region, uh, the region where you fail to reject the null hypothesis, uh, is the estimated mean difference plus minus four standard deviations. So the larger the standard deviation, the larger the acceptance region, and therefore, the harder it is to reject the null hypothesis. And so this is, um, so the more noise in the data, the higher the probability that you will uh, tend to incriminate the defendant. <laughs> That's sort of backwards. Um, P-value is really useless in, uh, in this type of uh, legal application. So the P-value only tells us whether the statistic uh, that we observed is unexpectedly extreme when the null hypothesis is true, is true. And so it really doesn't tell us a thing about whether the null hypothesis is true or not. 
In fact, it makes no sense to ask that question because the, fit, the null hypothesis is conditioned on uh, when we compute a p-value. And that's one issue. The other issue is that interpretation of p-values in court, and you know, this is uh, not only in court, is often wrong. So in court, two things are conflated. So when you get a small p-value, um, uh, the thought is that the probability that H naught is true is also tiny. And of course, we know that that's not correct. Um, p-values are also often confused with the probability of incorrectly concluding different source. So uh, p-values and type uh, one errors are often taken to be one and the same. And, um, and that, of course, is uh, a big issue. And failing to reject the null, of course, does not mean in any event that uh, the null is true. It's simply that we couldn't find enough evidence to uh, reject it. The issue of asymmetric, treat asymmetric treatment of the hypotheses, um, that's, that's what we know happen. That's by design in most hypothesis testing uh, situations. So to reject the null hypothesis, we have to have pretty strong evidence against it. And um, when we set up the null hypothesis in the way that ASTM tells us to set it up, then we have a problem, right? Because here we are um, putting a very high bar um, on um, acquitting the defendant when we should do, be doing exactly the opposite. So if we subscribe to the notion that it is better to let a guilty person go free than to um, incarcerate an innocent person, then we ought to be making it easier to reject the null hypothesis and we might consider doing that by increasing the type one error and decreasing the type two error, which is not what we would normally do. This is a really interesting point, and it is the fact that uh, a match is not necessarily probative. What do I mean by that? Well, um, even if we find that two items are indistinguishable, let's suppose that we find that um, the glass fragments on the suspect and the glass fragments from the broken window are really indistinguishable So, from a chemical point of view. Does that mean that uh, the suspect or the defendant is the source of, was at the crime scene? He was the person that broke the window. Actually, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that at all. So the match may have occurred by chance, um, uh, by pure chance. So uh, let's suppose that the defendant happens to be, um, uh, happens to live next to a construction site and uh, the windows that are being used in that construction site have uh, glass that was also uh, indistinguishable from the glass that was used in the broken window at the crime scene. Um, then the defendant might be walking around with glass fragments that are a match to the broken window, but that does not in any, of, in any case mean that uh, the defendant is the source of the evidence at the crime scene. So I'll talk a little bit uh, more about this in a second, but uh, the, the, the message here is that the p-value is absolutely silent about this. And that's a really important uh, part uh, that's a really important consideration in uh, forensic evaluations. I observe a match. Uh, what's a random match probability? What's the probability that that match is occurring uh, by chance alone? So um, a common approach uh, that uh, forensic sciences often use is called a two-stage approach. And uh, the, the, here the two, in the two-stage approach, the uh, the forensic problem is divided into two stages. The first stage is what we might call the similarity stage, and the second stage is what we might call the identification stage. So the first stage is the um, hypothesis testing uh, step that we were just uh, describing earlier. So in the first stage, you would determine whether the um, crime scene and the suspect objects agree on one or more uh, features. Um, so you might conclude that if you fail to reject the null hypothesis, 
then you would conclude that the two samples are indistinguishable or are a match or can be distinguished or whatever uh, expression uh, people use to um, say these two things appear to, I cannot distinguish between these two objects. And then the stage two is where you establish whether the match that you observed in stage one is actually probative. What does this mean? Is, is, would you expect to see a match even if the two items had a different source? If that's the case, then your evidence is not probative. But if observing a match when items have a different source is extraordinarily rare, then you would say that the match is probative. So the second stage assesses the significance of the agreement that you observed in the first stage by finding uh, the, the random match probability or the probability that the uh, agreement occurred by chance alone. Um, so um, this sounds reasonable, but there's again a bunch, so many statistical issues with this approach. First of all, uh, in stage one, we use a binary decision. So uh, the decision is to reject the null hypothesis or not. And of course, in order to do that, we have to select a cutoff point or a threshold. Uh, for example, uh, the famous 0.05 p-value uh, cutoff, or like ASTM suggested, the four sigma interval. Um, and of course, whatever we choose as a threshold has an impact on the error rates that are associated with that stage one test. So if I pick a low threshold that I make it easy to reject the null hypothesis, that uh, of course risks a type one error uh, of rejecting a true match. On the other hand, if I make the threshold very high, that makes it easy to accept the null hypothesis. So um, that risks the type two error, which is declaring uh, that non-matching populations are indistinguishable. And so I could incriminate a person incorrectly. So that's a problem. And so um, the other thing to note is that in order to estimate the random match probability, we need information about uh, the frequency of the feature we're looking at or the distribution of the feature we're looking at in the relevant population. Uh, for example, in the case of the chemical composition of glass, I would have to first define what is comparable glass. So would it be um, uh, glass manufactured by the same company during the same time period that was sold in the same geographic area? Uh, or would it be all um, uh, glass used for windows in uh, the entire country. So first I have to define the relevant population and then I have to go and measure the chemical composition that I'm looking at in samples from that relevant population. Without that reference population, uh, I cannot determine the random match probability. Now the problem of course, and I, cannot, I don't have time to get into that, is how do I define the relevant population? Uh, this is called the reference class problem, and it's not an easy problem to address. I'll, I'll say one more thing about that. Um, all right, so what's an alternative? Uh, an alternative would, um, well, here's an alternative. So I have evidence, and so what I really need to look at is evaluating the likelihood of that evidence. So how likely would I be to observe the evidence under the two competing hypotheses? Hypothesis one is that the defendant is the source of the evidence. That's what we might call the prosecution's hypothesis. And hypothesis two is that the defendant is not the source of the evidence, and that would be the defense's hypothesis. And so these two hypotheses roughly correspond to testing um, to, to stage one, um, and stage two in the two-stage approach. So um, the, 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 a better method is to um, summarize both steps by computing a likelihood ratio statistic. And so this likelihood ratio statistic simply looks at the 
probability of observing the evidence under the two competing hypotheses, and of course, values of the likelihood ratio that are bigger than one um, tend to favor the prosecution, and values of the likelihood ratio that are below one tend to favor the defense. Um, still not enough though, and this is uh, where I'm going to uh, drop it because I really don't have time to continue um, into this topic. But of course, in court, we're not interested in um, the likelihood ratio. So the likelihood ratio is something that the forensic expert might uh, present in court and say, I looked at the evidence and this is my conclusion. Uh, this evidence points to, you know, the likelihood ratio that I obtain is 100. And so that means that um, I, it's 100 times more likely to observe this evidence if in fact the suspect was the source of it than if he wasn't. Uh, and in DNA, for example, where this likelihood ratio is used uh, regularly, the type of likelihood ratio values you might get is a bazillion to one. So um, that's, uh, that's, where those, that's where those actual values come from. The problem is that in court, we're not interested in really in the likelihood ratio. So the jurors are asked to um, come up with probabilities for the hypothesis themselves. So they're asked uh, to assess whether the prosecution hypothesis uh, is correct or whether the defense hypothesis is correct, given the evidence they have heard uh, in court. Um, the, so, Notice that there's something, so this, these are really the conditional probabilities of interest. Um, there is something called the prosecutor's fallacy, and the prosecutor's fallacy is confusing, is reversing these conditionals, confusing the probability of observing the evidence under the hypothesis of same source uh, with the probability of same source under, the, under uh, given the evidence we have observed. Uh, this is uh, this is a problem that you look at in this happens all the time in court and and because it happens so often it has its own name. It turns out that in order to estimate the probability of these hypotheses uh, the way what you need to do is rely on Bayes theorem um, and so Bayes theorem allows you to revert these uh, the, the probability of the data given um, the model to the probability of the model given the data. Uh, but of course, there is no such thing as a free lunch. So in order to apply Bayes' theorem, you, we need to define a prior. Uh, and in the legal context, uh, the prior corresponds to uh, the background frequency of the evidence. So I need to know um, I need to know what the probability of observing um, the, a given range of chemical compositions in a fragment of glass is in the background population or in the reference population before I can apply Bayes' rule. And again, we run into this thorny issue of the choice of a reference class, which is really uh, a very difficult problem. So that's where I'm going to leave the first part. Uh, and. Uh, briefly talk about the second part of my talk. I have only a few slides here. Um, this is when p-values could be useful as a sentinel statistic, as I mentioned earlier. So um, in recent years, I'm sure everybody has heard about the algorithms that I use to predict behavior. And these have been uh, very popular in the criminal justice system recently. So these algorithms predict whether um, you know, should a person be released on bail? Uh, should uh, a person be offered parole? And so these uh, algorithms are called risk assessment tools in the uh, criminal justice system, and they're all the range. And so the way these algorithms go is um, you have some, you have a large number of individuals for whom you know the value of features, and features include age and sex and eth you know, ethnicity and a bunch of other things. Are they employed? Are they not employed? And that have gone through the criminal justice system, and some of them may have been released on bail, some, some of them may have been uh, granted parole, uh, 
and you and you follow them for a few years and you see how they behaved. And so the question is, can you train an algorithm to tell you whether individuals with certain characteristics are going to be more likely to reoffend in some way? Uh, there's a ton of different algorithms out there. Most of them are proprietary. And so they're real black boxes. You don't know what they um, look at and what they do. There's been a whole, there's an, a debate about whether these algorithms are fair in terms of uh, race. So are these race neutral? Um, so most algorithms do not use race as a feature, or at least the ones we know about, do not use race as a feature, that'd be a little too blatant, but they use variables such as criminal justice, uh, criminal history, um, that are very highly correlated to uh, race. And so it's well known that, uh, it's well known that for the same crime, blacks, blacks and Hispanics and other minorities are um, are arrested more often, are convicted more often, spend longer time in jail than uh, white offenders. And so these data are fraught with biases. So I don't want, I don't mean to pick on Pennsylvania, but these were the data that were uh, uh, most handy. So many states have been validating their own algorithms and Pennsylvania um, has uh, this one that to Pennsylvania's credit uh, is in the uh, public domain. So this is not a black box and it's kind of simple. It uses a few variables in order to try to um, classify people into two categories, high risk of reoffending or low risk of reoffending. And there's a middle there, but the, uh, the hope is to uh, be able to put people into those two categories. The algorithm uses age and gender and um, income, I think income and uh, employment history, and crucially, it also uses uh, criminal history. And so um, Pennsylvania has done extensive validation studies. Uh, the one that I'm going to talk about took over three years. Uh, they looked at about 27,000 cases and they used all kinds of fancy metrics to try to assess, um, you know, the, they looked at accuracy, in other words, the probability of a correct, um, um, a correct classification, the sensitivity and specificity, uh, of the classifier, the area under the curve, and so on. What they did not use was hypothesis testing. I am looking at Jim, I'm done? Hardly, okay. <laughs> um, and so I have two more, oh shoot, okay. I have two more slides uh, and that's about it. Uh, so looking at the, um, so here's some data from the Pennsylvania uh, study. So 27,000 individuals, they, they they came up with a bunch of tables. There's uh, 27,000 individuals tested. Of those 27,000, 15,000 were white and 53,000 uh, were black. And then there were others that I'm not, um, sorry. Uh, 19,000 were white and then 74,000 were black. I'm taking a subset of the individuals, just the black and the white. Um, of those, um, some of them were predicted to be low risk, some of them were predicted to be high risk, and then their behavior was observed. And so the question is, uh, were the predictions correct equally for the two races? Well, um, 1,500 uh, out of about 19,000 uh, white people were correctly predicted, either low or high risk, and about 4,000 were incorrectly predicted. It turns out that among the blacks, there was a much lower proportion of um, individuals that were correctly classified. Uh, so only 5,700 in 7,400. And so if one computes the chi-square statistic for, um, uh, to see whether the prediction is independent, the correctness of the prediction is independent of race, it turns out that the chi-square statistic comes up to be 12.35, and the p-value here is significant, it's very, very tiny. And so the, 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 the 
conclusion might be uh, we need to look into this a little bit more because it appears that the probability of correct predictions depends on race. So if we, this is the last slide I have. So if we were to sort of dig in a little bit more in terms of these predictions, let's just look at the low risk predictions. So these are the people that are granted bail or parole, uh, the people that are deemed to be low risk uh, if allowed to go into society. Well, it turns out again that um, 1,600 out of 15,000 uh, individuals who did not reoffend uh, were correctly. Um, let me think. Did I, did I? Do I have this backwards? So there were 15,000 out of the 19,000 uh, individuals who who did. Who, re who did not reoffend? Oh, I forget now. And and the truth, the, the and five thousand out of however many thousand uh, of the black individuals who did not reoffend. It turns out that um, the correct low risk prediction uh, was much higher. Uh, for the white defendants than for the black ones. And in this particular case, the chi-square statistic was a whole lot higher, 72.49. And so again, um, what this is suggesting is that black individuals are incorrectly predicted to be high risk more often than, than white individuals. So, um, I um, meant to add another slide <laughs> as a summary, and I completely spaced out and didn't. So I am going to stop my uh, presentation right here. Uh, oh, yeah, stop my presentation right here and ho hope for some questions at the very end. Thank you, Alicia. Yes, you've raised some very interesting uh, issues with our criminal justice system and uh, I, I will have a question and I think others are coming in so we'll uh, come back to you at the at the end of the uh, next presentation. So now we turn to James Hong. He is going to talk about the roles of multiplicity adjustment in regulatory applications and he, James Hung, is the director of the Division of Biometrics in the Office of Biostatistics and Translational Sciences at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. During his tenure with the FDA, James has extensive experience in reviewing research, in reviewing large mortality and morbidity clinical trials in cardiovascular and renal disease areas. His research covers utility of p-value, factorial design trials, adaptive designs, non-inferiority trial designs, and multi-regional clinical trials. He made significant contributions to the FDA guidance documents on adaptive designs, non-inferiority designs, and multiple endpoints. And he received the FDA CDER Scientific Achievement Award and other awards for recognition of his scientific contributions to the FDA. James Hong is also a fellow of the American Statistical Association. And there is his opening slide, and I turn the uh, program over to you, James. Thank you. Oh, uh, Jim, can you hear me? Yes. You're... Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, my talk will be about uh, multiplicity adjustment or control um, in regulatory applications. Uh, obviously, this is related to, uh, related to a p-value. Um, as a discla disclaimer, this presentation reflects my view um, and should not be construed to represent FDA's views or policies. First, I would I will start uh, with a brief introduction uh, of the drug development process and the clinical trials 
under regulatory uh, application setting. And then focus on <laughs> clinical trials for uh, proving efficacy and explain the rationale uh, or principle of uh, multiplicity control uh, for the clinical trials uh, proving efficacy. And share my views on um, remaining uh, challenges and close the talk with a few remarks. <clears throat> So uh, <laughs> according to the, uh, this FDA guidance, um, the drug development process um, for regulatory applications comprises five essential steps. It begins with discovery and development and followed by clinical, uh, preclinical research and clinical research regulatory application uh, uh, then is then uh, submitted to FDA for review of efficacy data and the safety data. The last step uh, is the FDA post-market um, post uh, safety monitoring. In the preclinical research phase, uh, drugs undergo uh, laboratory and the animal testing uh, to answer basic questions about safety so that a safety margin uh, is determined so that um, the, the people or humans can be given drugs safely uh, for testing. In the clinical research uh, phase, the drugs are tested on humans to make sure that uh, they are safe and effective. As we all know that uh, efficacy uh, assessment, uh, clinical trials are often uh, divided into uh, well-known four phases, uh, phase one, two, three, four. Uh, however, the lines between the phases are increasingly vague. Um, essentially, and for efficacy assessment, um, it is probably prudent to group clinical trials into three uh, groups. The trials providing uh, proof of concept and trials for uh, learning, exp uh, exploring efficacy uh, based on the data of uh, relatively homogeneous humans with disease and conditions. And trials uh, for proving efficacy or effectiveness um, in a larger uh, number of intention to treat patients. Um, in the randomized clinical trials, um, uh, patients are randomized to receive either a test drug uh, or a control for comparison. Each trial, <clears throat> each clinical trial um, um, tests um, multiple clinical statistical hypotheses uh, for uh, multiple doses or dosing regimens, uh, multiple endpoints. Uh, commonly, there's only one uh, primary and the multiple secondary and the multiple patient subgroups uh, some of which may be uh, targeted. Um, uh, for, for, for instance, the biomarker positive group um, that may be uh, the focus of the, of the trial. And the hypothesis can be uh, tested uh, for multiple times. Um, for instance, when, when the when drug starts to, to be effective, how long the drug's effect uh, maintains. Um, um, furthermore, uh, a non-hypothesis may be tested uh, multiple times. Um, for instance, uh, the hypothesis for uh, maze, uh, which is the major adverse clinical events, such as uh, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, 
um, or stroke uh, could be tested um, to allow for uh, stopping the trial uh, early because of uh, ethical consideration. Within each trial, uh, the hypotheses um, may have a complex relationship among them. For, exa for example, in a, a heart failure trial, a test drug uh, may reduce the instance of mortality mobility, uh, but may or may not improve uh, quality, of li quality of life, while another drug may uh, improve benefits for both domains. In practices for efficacy assessment, uh, we search for at least two positive or successful trials, and then decide on what trial results to include uh, in labeling, especially for efficacy. So within each trial, a, a st statistical uh, criteria, a criterion um, often used is to control the overall, uh, also called the family-wise or study-wise uh, type 1 error probability at the fixed level of alpha, uh, say two-sided uh, 5%. The overall type 1 error probability is a probability of mistakenly rejecting a non-hypothesis regardless of other hypotheses. And within each trial, uh, each individual um, non-hypothesis is tested uh, at the level of uh, normal, at that particular alpha. Uh, mostly the, the p-value is no larger than that particular alpha. Uh, under uh, either union's intersection uh, testing scenario or um, intersection union testing scenario. Multiplicity control is applied often only to screen out the non-hypotheses uh, so that the trial results uh, could be used for regulatory uh, decision-making and for labeling. After multi multiplicity control, a p-value is often used to assess the strength of evidence against the non-hypothesis. Uh, within uh, each uh, individual trial in a uniform fashion. Now for a rejected uh, non-hypothesis, um, there are many views on whether the p-value uh, needs to be adjusted uh, following the pre-specified multiple testing procedure. If adjusted, uh, one would say that uh, the definition of p-value is changed uh, because then uh, it has to depend on, um, uh, depend on the uh, other um, hypotheses uh, considered. If not adjusted, then the same uh, magnitude of the p-value against the non-hypothesis and the same non-hypothesis may have different implications in different trials. Multiplicity control is applied uh, of, uh, often you, uh, within um, each pivotal trial, uh, not to the drug development program. In learning trials, uh, multiplicity control is rarely uh, applied. Uh, so uh, selecting hypotheses based on the nominal p-value uh, without some kind of multiplicity control uh, may affect the success probability in pivotal trials. So I, just, I just want to emphasize that <clears throat> the multiplicity control is really applied within each trial. So, you, so we can imagine that um, there will be some challenges um, in, in, in considering multiple trials. There was 
there was one instance where hypothesis <coughs> was tested in two pivotal trials and p-values was very small, but did not pass the pre-specified uh, multiple testing scheme within each trial. But the trial results uh, give us the impression that uh, this non-hypothesis is very likely to have been mistakenly uh, screened out. So the, the question is, what the regulatory decision uh, should be, I mean, at least from statistical point of view. The multiplicity control, uh, we, we have been using, um, still have many uh, challenges. Um, first, the clinical context uh, behind hypotheses are often different. Um, such as the dose versus endpoint and versus subgroup. That is rejecting a non-hypothesis for a dose um, gives a, a different uh, clinical context than rejecting a, uh, a non-hypothesis for, for an endpoint. Why did he use um, uh, for multiplicity control is a uh, single string uh, hierarchical, hierarchical testing. That is, you continue testing the string of non-hypotheses in a, in a hierarchical uh, sequence uh, until a non-hypothesis cannot be rejected. Um, this seems to be very simple. Um, at least operationally, um, but often this is not sensible uh, considering uh, clinical context. So conceptually, um, the relationship between the relevant hypotheses uh, needs to be considered, um, but how? Um, that is not trivial. If um, a primary uh, endpoint uh, requires uh, two positive trials, uh, like symptom, symptom endpoint, but a secondary endpoint, uh, say a death, uh, needs only one positive trial, then in these scenarios, um, at least two trials got involved, um, namely the two trials uh, will be tested for the prime endpoint separately and, and combined uh, for testing the second, second endpoint. So what is the overall type of error? Because the overall type of error will be uh, something beyond uh, one trial. A more complicated um, scenario is that uh, a randomized clinical trial uh, may involve uh, testing a reasonably likely uh, surrogate for accelerate approval, followed by testing clinical uh, benefit endpoint. Uh, so in case that this surrogate fails or does not appear to uh, predict clinical benefit during the trial, the drug sponsor uh, could still continue the trial to directly test uh, the clinical benefit endpoint. So what is the overall type of error in this uh, scenario? What if in a drug de development program, there's only one positive trial, a pivotal trial, uh, with a tiny p-value? Uh, is this equivalent to um, um, having two positive trials with P this and 0.05 say. What if in that program that there are, <clears throat> there are only two out of 10 trials positive? Um, is that the same as, um, is the strength of evidence um, equivalent to posit two positives out of two 
what about <clears throat> in the scenario that uh, the trial results are simply described but not formally tested? Um, this is important. Uh, such description may be necessary uh, to understand the performance of the drug effect, um, such as uh, the drug can start to be effective uh, two weeks uh, after taking, uh, or the drug's effect may sustain uh, one year, which is, um, well, such information is uh, very useful to consumers, and in fact, it's very important to consumers. Uh, it may invite comparison uh, among drugs, um, although it's not uh, intended. So if so, should such uh, trial results, uh, descriptive, be subject to a formal testing uh, under some kind of multiplicity uh, adjustment? In, in several complex application scenarios, uh, such as use of master protocol under which um, uh, several applicants can participate to study their own uh, medical products um, against a, say, a common control. Do statistical tests um, for multiple drugs uh, need multiplicity adjustment or control? Say, if uh, these products have the same mechanism of action for efficacy. Um, the answer probably yes. Uh, what about if these products have different mechanism, mechanism of action for efficacy? Uh, the answer probably is not. A few, a few remarks. Um, multiplicity control has served reasonably well in um, screening non hypotheses uh, within a desirable limit for regulatory applications. Still, uh, many questions, um, um, are there, uh, even within uh, each trial for each drug. Um, for instance, should those uh, selected for marketing be based on hypothesis testing? Uh, so one example we, we see is uh, that in cardiovascular um, outcome trials, the MACE trials, often the two doses selected are not far apart. And so the two doses actually show very similar uh, treatment effects. So testing uh, doses in that scenario uh, may not be prudent. Once a drug is shown effective on an endpoint, we may need uh, for the description of the drug performance on that endpoint. Uh, one example is, uh, is uh, that the, the prime endpoint is a composite um, clinical endpoint. And where if that shows a, a treatment effect, uh, we, 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 we need to uh, see how the drugs affect all the components of the composite um, and the des description of such results is very important to the consumers and also to the researchers. So in those scenarios, uh, such statements, whatever given, uh, can render a competitive edge. Uh, the question is, should it, shouldn't they be subject to uh, some kind of multiplicity control? If the answer is yes, uh, it will become more uh, complicated uh, because you had to consider uh, that's just within the trial, maybe across um, um, pivotal trials or supportive trials. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is all I have. Thank you, James for that presentation. <clears throat> I will ask the other, uh, you can unshare your, or stop sharing your screen, James. <clears throat>
And I will ask the other speakers to uh, unmute and uh, join a brief question and answer period. Let me, uh, let me start with a question about um, guilt and innocence. Um, so first the comment, thanks for pointing out that the p-value assumes the suspect is guilty, is the comment from David Colquhoun. <laughs> and that this is incompatible with the basic principles of justice. The case of, of law providing one of the strongest arguments for Bayesian approaches that I know. What matters is the probability of being guilty given the evidence and p-values tell nothing about that. Yep, I would have to completely agree. <laughs> I, I might throw in this comment. I once surveyed my uh, my introductory statistics class whether type one or type two error is more important in this context where you're assuming innocence. And unfortunately, most of them thought type two error was more important. They were more concerned about uh, a a person going a suspect going free than they were about an innocent person being charged. So oh wow, that's uh, not relevant here. Another <laughs> question. Uh, Regarding the, um, the use of something like an equivalence test or a non-inferiority test, is that being used in the context of forensics? Of, uh, forensics? Yes. So there's a yes. The pro, the equivalence test has been proposed. Um, it's not. Um, so it's a possibility. It's not being used. The problem is that you know forensic practitioners are very tied to these standards, to these ASTM standards that tell them how to do everything they do in the crime labs. And so um, anything that's not part of a standard is uh, not really used in practice, mostly because uh, then you get questioned in court, why didn't you follow the standard? And so, <laughs> so it, that's an issue for, it's, it's a problem for, um, trying out new things. So your center is uh, focused on creating better standards, I presume. Yes, or at least uh, pointing to where some of those standards could definitely see some improvement. Yes, a uh, question from uh, Phil Cott um, for Yoha. What do you think of the home Bonferroni procedure in the that, um, that's an improvement over the Bonferroni. Uh, theoretically, very convenient. Uh, it controls the family Y0 rate and it is uh, used. It is used uh, in the, by FDA. Uh, the only problem is that uh, it gives a very small gain in many cases. Very small gain. Uh, because it, it keeps this because the criteria is the same and this is unlike the two other uh, methods or the, two, the three other strategies that are changed the criteria all of them control the probability of making any error if nothing is true if no hypothesis uh, but they, but they differ in terms of the power and in terms of the protection they offer sometimes the protection is needed fully needed as in uh, uh, phase three trials, and sometimes it is not, as in earlier trials, for example. Okay, there's another uh, question here from Justice Diasi. Do you think that part of the criticism for the p-value stems from the not using the exact p-values or the exact tests, especially when small samples are involved, and the p-value is close to the threshold. Um, no, I don't think that, uh, that this is a major problem. As you say, close to the threshold. Uh, you know, uh, just if you have two endpoints, you have to, to consider possibly p less than 0 0.025 rather than 0 0.05. So this is a much... Uh, a much bigger, this has much bigger impact than about exact p-values. Uh, there are methods, uh, especially to, to take care of exact method, exact test as well with multiplicity, but I don't think the issue of 
I mean, the test that should be used is the right test under the right uh, condition. But uh, once it's you, only, once you have the people who calculate that out of it, I mean, you run into the same problems. Uh, a comment uh, from, uh, or actually a, a question and a comment from David Colicon. Would you agree, uh, this is directed at you, Alicia, would you mm. agree that the risk algorithms are circular? If, for example, blacks are wrongly found guilty more often than whites, then they will appear wrongly to be high risk and that will lead to more wrong convictions. Yes, uh, that's exactly right. So the problem is not necessarily in the algorithms, but in the data that they're using to fit these algorithms. And if you use criminal history, that's a losing proposition right off the bat, because we know that, I mean, like I said, there's abundant statistics that show that Blacks and Hispanics are you know, are not treated the same as whites by the criminal justice system. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's circular in the sense that you keep perpetuating the same biases, but now with the veneer of science. It, the ethics of algorithms, yes, something we want to talk more about. Definitely. Here's another, go ahead. Here's another question from Jingqing Zhang. By quote, surrogate endpoint <clears throat> may fail to predict clinical outcome. Do we mean surrogate endpoint may not, statistic may not be statistically significant while the true clinical outcome actually will be? It's a question for James. Okay, uh, I think so. this is an excellent question. Um, when we say uh, the surrogate um, does not appear to predict the clinical endpoint, this uh, premise before at the design stage, we had to discuss that. Namely, when we use this paradigm, we had to, because we are, we are talking about a reasonably likely uh, surrogate, we are not talking about just surrogate. Uh, we are talking about the reasonably likely surrogates. So in, in <clears throat> as such, that some kind of model has been built uh, based on the external uh, data or the ex uh, ex external experience, but that does, that does not mean that particular model is always applicable to the, to the ongoing trial setting. So one may design a trial using that uh, model and, and, then, and, then, and then believe that, and then, and then um, believe, and then, you know, kind of form the belief that that um, the surrogate is going to work, and then because of that, so the clinical endpoint would uh, would also be, uh, be be shown effective. I mean, the treatment effect. But what happened at the, at some point of the trial that the data did not uh, did not show that. So in that situation, um, you know, the sponsor can say, "Well, okay, well, that basically is against my belief, right? So therefore, we just terminate the trial." Or they, they could say, well, uh, maybe the model we use is not, you know, is not very reliable in, 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 some, in some sense. So maybe, you know, the, the truck can, can continue to the end uh, just for testing directly uh, on the clinical endpoint. Thank you. Okay, here's a question I think for both Yoav and James. Would Bayesian approaches help to solve the quandary of evaluating multiplicity when looking after a trial for questions such as how long the drug works or how early does it start working? So, uh, shall I, uh, I go first? Yeah, <laughs> <There's, please. laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, I think I, I gave a, a vivid example to show the, how sensitive is Bayesian statistics to the exactness of the assumed trial. Uh, it doesn't protect uh, against uh, it doesn't protect against uh, uh, this issue of uh, selection that James uh, suggested. Um, what can what can offer a solution in this case are 
uh, both conditional tests, where conditional tests exactly condition on the way you got in without any assumption of uh, trial. And by uh, relying on this conditioning, they offer the right protection for the selection. And the other one, there is a whole set of uh, ideas being developed in the last uh, three or four years, which are, uh, which I gave a very simple example of hierarchical testing, uh, where hierarchical, I, I gave the example of one family primary endpoints, one secondary endpoints, you test at the first hierarchy, you continue only with those that turned out to be significant. This can be, and this is now the recent papers that they expanded to, uh, for instance, using microbiome on the guts or in, in uh, bioinformatics that go several, uh, several levels uh, down. And you can easily think about these two questions of uh, uh, further questions like how early and so on to go on. And the point is, the, the point of these methods is that if you did a lot of selection until you got to that place, then you, take, you have to take a harsher point of view. If you got there without, uh, without uh, much selection and everything came out significant, you can work at the end with the original, with a marginal confidence interval and you will be protected as well. So this, these two directions of research, which are ongoing, uh, can solve the problem. I don't think that Bayesian can, uh, can offer, especially if you go there and you have no idea what a prior should be. And you certainly cannot assume that you sampled your parameters from exactly this prior. You want to add to that, James? Yeah, I think I agree with uh, your your. Um, I I mean, this is my view. I don't see how um, Bayesian can avoid uh, uh, selection problem. But on the other hand. Uh, say if we say uh, the hypothesis already uh, formed and it got tested and some of the non-hypothesis got rejected. So the trial is pretty, pretty much positive. Now beyond that, say how are we going to deal with the descriptive um, results? Um, I think something other than the uh, other than the p other than p value probably can be can be can be uh, thought about, um, and that's it's going to be very complicated. But uh, when I have to run into some some kind of conditional argument, conditional on the you know the trial result is positive, and what is the likelihood that that this you know this descriptive result is real and and is worth uh, being included uh, for the label uh, in the label. Um, so I think that's something we can think about it. Yeah, I think uh, I think we have room for time for one more. Uh, this comment from Eugene Kamaroff. R.A. Fisher proposed pooling p-values from multiple experiments in his writings. Has that idea uh, been considered by the FDA? Uh, yes or no? I I think um, you're asking me, right? Uh, well, I, anyone can comment. <laughs> the FDA is for all of us. <laughs> yeah, once I think it's, uh, once uh, the decision is made as to whether the trials can be combined, they suppose the trials can be combined, then obviously there's a p-value combination approach uh, is one of the viable approaches uh, uh, to, to consider. Okay, I think uh, there's still some more questions here. If any of you want to uh, respond to them individually, you may do that. Uh, for the audience, if, you, uh, if your question didn't get answered, you can certainly uh, send them to the speakers individually. Yeah. I want to thank all the speakers for their presentations. Alicia, Yoav, James, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for contributing to the mission of NIST with this uh, with this event. Thanks for the invitation. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay well and stay safe. You too. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye. <laughs>